Okay, let, let's get going. Um, welcome to the November Java user group meeting. We've got um, usual, we've got uh, news. Jonathan's going to do a presentation on uh, his experiences at DevOps, so that's going to be quite interesting. Um, we usually start off the meeting by going around the room, quickly just saying what we, our name, what we do with Java, and just keep track of what everybody else says in case you want to meet up after and have a little chat. So start with... So this is our usual housekeeping slide. Um, we have a mailing list on Google Groups. We have um, a meetup.com group, which is probably the best way to find out about our meetings if you sign up there and follow that meetup. Uh, and we have a Google Plus community, which is not very active right now. I haven't seen anything happen in it in a while, but it does exist. Um, we record these, these meetings and post them. So if you go to tjug.ca slash videos, you can watch the previous meetings. The last one isn't up yet because I made a typo in the title slide and then got discouraged and never re-rendered it, but I'm going to do that tonight. Um, and we have a mailing list dedicated to job postings as well. So you can sign up for that or you can post to it um, for Java jobs in Toronto. So that's what we try to focus on. And we're pretty um, hardcore about not letting spam through. So if it's you're safe to sign up for it. If you're interested in Java jobs, you're not going to get anything but Java jobs. just came to my attention like three days ago. When, when somebody posts a message on the meetup group, you get an email and it says you can reply to the email to reply to that message. I've been doing that and I just found out that none of my replies ever got sent. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so I usually log into the site and... So I have to apologize to Ben among other people because I, I actually wrote back, sorry. Um, oh. But it went into a black hole and I didn't know until like... Like the story. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, I found out because the, the last person I wrote back to was a, turned out to be a recruiter and she actually followed up. Aha. Uh -huh. She yep. didn't say she was a recruiter until yeah, follow up. But um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now I know. So, sorry, sorry if, if you wrote to me and I, and I ignored you because I actually wrote back. Yeah. So, yeah, we're still learning the meetup.com thing, but it's. Yeah. Uh, we have, we, there's like. 500 people signed up or something for the... Oh, it's like 700. So, yeah. It, I, I hope they all don't come to a meeting at once. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we have a discount from O'Reilly Books. They like to sponsor Java user groups. So if you're looking for, uh, looking for books, there's the discount code there. And um, put it in the site. You get a really good discount on their books. Um, all right, so Java news for this month. The JCP has had an election, which they have every five years, I think. So the last one was in 2000 or so. Um, so they've got uh, a new set of companies uh, backing the JCP and participating on the committees, which is really interesting. It's neat to see, uh, neat to see Twitter in there, actually. I guess they're heavy JVM users. Um, but an interesting group. Uh, if you Google for the JCP election, you'll find all sorts of information and the actual vote numbers of like <coughs> what the votes were and the runners up and all that kind of stuff. So. Goldman Sachs is up. What's, what's the difference between the two that I can see? Yeah, I, like the I don't know what the difference is. Top yeah, one is. Or, <laughs> no, that's very helpful. This all came from Sun originally. The, the top ones are essentially Java support customers. Okay, so they've kind of paid so their the way. Sun <laughs> wanted to treat specially as very important customers, and now Oracle does the same. The ones at the bottom nominated themselves and got elected. <laughs> so, London Java community. Are they, are they their user group, maybe? They are. That's um, Martin uh, and Ben Evans. Oh, Ben Evans, right, okay. Um, Trisha G? Yes, although she moved to Spain. So ah, anymore. right. Okay, uh, a couple security updates. Um, if you're using Spring Social in any of your stuff, um, especially their, their login links features, you need to update it because very bad things will happen otherwise. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a very critical update. Um, anytime you use a login link, it can be 
clicked on by anyone to take over your account. So not very good. And another big one in Commons Collections, which a lot of major tools use, and it involves object deserialization. So if you run a major Java web application platform, you should make sure you update that too, uh, because you're at, you're at risk from uh, remote code execution. So it's very exciting. Uh, none of these are actual JVM problems, but they do let arbitrary bytecode run. And that's, that's very <coughs> scary. Uh, especially if you run an app without a security manager, which is pretty common. Uh, you, it has access to your whole computer, really. Refreshing after last year's sequence of every month we had a new Java Zero Day. And yeah, and if your app server is running as root, then this code runs as root. So very exciting. Um, oh, out of order slide. OK. So the, um, the TIOBE survey is out for this month, and Java is back on the top. Uh, it was slightly below C, but it's the most popular language for developers and support right now, based on search engines and various other metrics. So it's, a, it's an interesting index, but um, it's, it's been uh, interesting to see sort of the decline of uh, C++ and of PHP, <laughs> which are both kind of thankfully going away. Um, it's been really interesting. Also, this one doesn't include uh, Swift or Objective-C, but they're sort of crossing very quickly. Everyone's um, preferring Swift. This is quite, quite interesting to see. Yeah, uh, Ruby. Ruby's just like it's, it's just always Ruby. <laughs> so this is uh, an interesting one if you're following the Java 9 builds. Um, there's a new string representation in Java that's supposed to save memory, and this just came out in the latest. Like the implementation is active in the latest Java 9 build. So they're making more compact strings and sort of future-proofing it so they can use different encodings in the future. Um, they've done a lot of stats and realized that most strings don't need a full 16-bit representation. So representing them as UTF-8 or some other sort of more optimal encoding can save a lot of memory in Java applications. So if you're just using Java, you shouldn't even notice. Your app shouldn't notice. If you're doing anything really funny with JNI or other things like that, it might notice. But it should be pretty straight ahead. Um, does anybody else have any other Java news, exciting new releases, things like that that's happened? I just checked with, because of that. My impression also was that last year wasn't it like zero dash points all the time. It's 138 is the total number of days since there has been. Oh, that's pretty good. Yep, and there was a new, my computer just prompted me to download a new Java today. Yes. So I, I saw that. I was like, okay, okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I, I updated. So <laughs> did It's got some cool new stuff. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, new Android Studio. I guess with um, real near real-time deployment to devices. I saw that. That's like, apparently you can, you can hit run on my device, and it's two seconds now to push the code over. And it starts up. Everybody's excited about that. All right. So that's all, all the news I had. Um, and Jonathan's going to tell us about his experience at DevOx. All right. So I went to DevOx, which is a conference in Belgium. I attended 17 hours worth of talks when I was there, and I took notes for most of them. And now I'm going to distill all of that into 45 minutes of discussion with everybody here. So this is like the <laughs> espresso of, of content. But no, it's, it's extremely lossy. <laughs> So first, I'd like to say thanks to the DevOps organizers for hiring a professional photographer to take pictures of everything that happened at the conference and then posting it all on Flickr under a Creative Commons license. Because the background of pretty much every slide after, this, after the next one, sorry, is uh, from them. So thanks. That was awesome. This slide I stole from Google. This is totally illegal that you're seeing this right now. Um, just. <laughs> Out of, out of interest, the 
conference happens in Antwerp, Belgium, which is there, kind of in the middle of the map. There's a star on it. Um, it's near Brussels, Amsterdam, London, Paris, other places. There's high-speed trains between all those places. So if you think about going to DevOx, which I, th I hope you will, especially after we're done here, you could fly to any of those places and, and have a high-speed rail connection to Antwerp and enjoy a vacation with some travel paid for by your employer around it. Is so it that's good. Yeah. Yes, uh, there are. It, it's kind of franchised now. There are other DevOps conferences in London and Paris, and I can't remember. There's what? There's a third place, but um, they, they have around Europe now. But the original DevOps that's been going on for many years is, is in Antwerp and is still the biggest of them. So the conference itself happens in a modern multiplex theater in kind of like a uh, suburb of Antwerp. A uh, lot of people can fit in one talk. So it's actually kind of bigger, bigger talks than at a lot of conferences that you might have gone to before. That's a typical room. There are eight of them, I think. So days one and two at the conference are sold separately. They're called DevOps University. And they are three-hour sessions with a little intermission in the middle. And uh, Dan and I attended a DevOps University. Three years ago? Yeah, three, wow. maybe four years ago. Um, <laughs> And I don't know, some of it was good. It was a little bit hit and miss at that, that year. I haven't been back to one since, so I don't know. But um, I didn't go to that again this year, so I have no idea what happened on days one and two. Day three was the first traditional conference day. It started with the opening keynote. And the opening keynote was introduced by a little humanoid robot called Pepper. Um, these are made by a company, a French-based company. They had a previous one that had legs as well. This is the newer model. Um, it's a kind of a learning platform and a teaching platform for learning to program robotics. And you can program it in Java, so that's cool. It can talk. It can see you. It can move its arms. So it introduced the, uh, the keynote speakers. The first human keynote speaker was Stefan Janssen. He Organizes, he's sort of the, the main organizer of DevOps. It grew out of a user group, kind of like ours, but bigger, a Belgian Java user group. And they decided to have an annual conference that was bigger with invited speakers, and that became DevOps. Was right? Yes, it was originally called Java Polis, and Sun sued them out of that name. <laughs> so they renamed it to Javox, and Sun sued them again. Uh, so now it's called DevOx. <laughs> There's a nightclub near the venue called Knox, N-O-X-X, -X, and it was kind of named for that. Stefan feels that software is the new rock and roll. So the uh, DevOx family of, of endeavors used to include a website called Parlays that was for online learning. They posted all the DevOx content to Parlays. Um, it was for pay, but they gave everybody who attended DevOx a one-year subscription so they could see all the content. Uh, Parlays has now been shut down. They announced that at the keynote. And there's this new initiative that they've been working on instead of it that they call Voxed. It's a website. It's kind of like a Java news blog. It's really good. It's worth definitely worth checking out. Yeah, Dan, Dan has been using it as a source of some of the news here. And he recommended it to me. And so I've been using it now as a source of some of the news here. It's not exclusively Java. It's kind of like it's a very industry, um, industry newspaper kind of thing that they're doing. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what the business model is around it, but they've pledged to never have advertising on it. I don't know. How, how they're paying for that because they don't charge for content. But that's the deal. Does anyone here read it? Voxed? It's at voxed.com. Okay, well, maybe you will. 
The next keynote speaker was Mark Reinhold. He's the Java platform architect at Oracle. And he talked about Jigsaw again. Um, Jigsaw has been the topic of Java keynotes for the last 18 months or so. So there were zero surprises in this keynote. Next keynote speaker was Lawrence Krauss, who is a noted theoretical physicist and skeptic. And he talked about the science of observing the earliest moments of the universe, the sort of earlier, astronomically speaking, looking, looking into the, the very beginning of time in the background radiation and, and making some breakthroughs and making sense of some of the fuzz that comes in the first few minutes of, of the universe. Um, he says we're going to learn something about how the universe works and we're going to learn some things that we can't recreate in particle accelerators because we would need a particle accelerator sort of the size of the moon's orbit around the earth to get those energies. So that was cool. And then he closed it out by saying that everything is futile and the whole universe is going to die and, and uh, everything you learn here, apply it if you like, but your advances will be fleeting at best. So that was just sort of to kick things off. And then he did a, <laughs> then he did a Q and A while he was riding on this weird wheel thing. Apparently, this was something that they just had around. It, he didn't bring it with him. Uh, he might be a robot. He might be. Uh, but probably not because um, apparently in the rehearsal for the keynote, which happened the same day, just earlier in the morning, um, he also spontaneously grabbed one of these things and started riding around on it. First time he ever tried one and he went too fast. Uh, threw himself off of it forward over his laptop, which hit the ground, and uh, he injured himself a little bit on the podium. <laughs> so anyway, take two, he, he was much more graceful on it for the real thing. So on to some talks. The first talk I went to was called Principles of Microservices, presented by this guy. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, sorry, I don't know the names of most of the presenters. He's got one but of those invisible <laughs> Yeah, they all do. Um, things I learned in this talk, according to the notes I took, he recommends uh, a Ruby testing framework called PACT for consumer driven testing. So, the idea is when, when you're putting a bunch of small services out on the network and you want to be able to upgrade them at will. If you're doing that, you'd like to know that the consumers of your service aren't going to break because of your, the upgrade that you're pushing out. So the idea is that your acceptance tests should probably be provided by the teams that consume your service. And so you can push out an upgrade as long as the tests they gave you don't fail. You have your own tests as well, of course. You have, you have your own unit tests, your own integration tests, but if, um, if you want to be able to push out upgrades without notice that, that you ought to have some tests from your consumers. So framework for that. Pardon? You mentioned something about using a framework. The framework, uh, it's called PACT, P-A-C-T. It's the agreement between you and your consumers. It sounds like a lame deferral technology. Yes, <laughs> it might be. So how would you initiate that? Well, you could ask them to model their use cases of your API in... You run them. As a condition of, of deploying an upgrade, all of the tests that they provided to you have to pass. Um, he recommends Swagger for JSON API documentation. Um, he had the idea of a humane registry, which is... When you've got a bunch of services all over the place, you have like dev and QA and production and so on, um, people should be able to find them easily and just try calling them. So his, his idea is kind of the concept is a humane registry, which is a wiki page that lists all these things and how you contact them and where you get credentials to, to try them out. Um, 
and point to all the Swagger docs for them and so on. Uh, and he says, just use a wiki page because it's for people to consume. You don't need a, a machine readable registry for development and discovery. Um, the circuit breaker pattern is extremely important when you have a distributed system where some servers call other servers because you can have kind of like a meltdown if, if some service isn't working and another service is calling it over and over and over and over again to try and get some response, especially if there's some retry logic and there's new requests coming in the front end, you can melt down your whole cloud. And I guess it starts raining or something at that point. Um, so the, the pattern to prevent that is the circuit breaker, where if, the, if there's a certain number of failures coming back from the server, which might, if you're using HTTP, that might be like 500 errors or 400 errors, um, or you just, you're getting timeouts, what you should do is stop trying for a little while and just send little probe requests maybe once every 10 seconds to see if the service is back up and healthy. And then you can sort of ramp back up on full full uh, request rate after that. So Hystrix was what he was recommending for Circuit Breaker. You can also monitor the telemetry on your Circuit Breakers to see how many requests per second are happening, how many are successful, how many are failing, what's the latency. All that kind of stuff is really important when stuff starts to go wrong. And you'll probably want some history on, on those kinds of metrics. Um, and Hystrix provides enough logging and, and visibility to give you those things. Uh, another recommendation from this talk was having what, what's called a correlation ID on requests. Because what used to be method calls, that when something fails way down in the stack, you get an exception and you get a whole stack trace, that goes away when you turn method calls into network requests. So the way to kind of fix that is to, as a, a separate HTTP header in each request down the line, have some sort of UUID that correlates all those requests so when you take them all together in your log aggregator, you can basically piece together what you used to get for free as a stack trace. Um, and then there was a, a website outlining a lot of this advice called buildingmicroservices.com. Did he uh, talk at all about uh, making each microservice have its own database? Is that something that I'm yes, that's important as well, the resource isolation. Um, he did. He did talk about that. Um, each microservice should own its own data store, and the only way to access it should be through APIs that the service exposes publicly. That could be like different schemas in the same physical database if you want, but nobody outside of the service's own code should understand what the schema is behind. So next was uh, some hints about Spring object design. It was sort of an up to and including Spring 4.2, which is the current stable release type presentation. So it wasn't necessarily about things that are new in Spring 4.2, but just uh, sort of cumulative, here's the way we think you should design your apps type presentation. Uh, one of the big highlights of this was that in Spring, you can compose annotations together. So if you're always using the same three annotations in similar circumstances, their recommendation is you make your own meta annotation and put that everywhere. So it's sort of just the don't repeat yourself principle. That way if you wanted to change one of the attributes that you're copying on your three dozen classes, you can change it in one place instead of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, another one was that you can declare beans in spring with the at bean annotation uh, is a method that returns some type. That method then becomes sort of like a factory for that type. And if you have regular values, you can't have multiple methods that produce the same type because then there's some uh, question about which one should be called. But it turns out uh, in Spring, what they felt was the most obvious way to deal with that for collection types is to uh, concatenate all the collections together. So if you have three bean definition methods that all return list, you get all the items um, from calling all three methods and concatenating the list together. And it works for sets and ar arbitrary collections, maps as well. So that's... What, what happens if there's a conflict with maps? 
I don't know. <laughs> they probably thought of that. I don't know what the answer is. Maybe. Um, something uh, Spring does different from CDI is all of the injection is eager by default, so cycles can be a problem. Uh, but Spring provides an annotation called at lazy that you can annotate any injection point with at lazy, and that turns it into a proxy that resolves on first usage. So you can get yourself out of injection cycles with some at lazy placed where you need them. You can also use the Java 8 optional type to achieve the same thing. So instead of at lazy, you can put your type inside of an optional. And then when you get it, that will be when it resolves. So the framework is aware of that. And it doesn't try to inject the thing until you get from the optional. Uh, you can also mix and match Java x.inject annotations with the Spring annotations. So Spring has an annotation called auto-wired. Java x.inject has the at inject annotation. You can use either one freely, whichever one you like better. Um, Spring also supports the, like the CDI lifecycle methods like post-construct and pre-destroy and all of those things. Um, that came as a surprise to me, not at this talk, but earlier in my use of Spring. I didn't expect it to support that, but it does. And there was some magic around annotating uh, date field in, like, if you have a, a class member called, uh, w sorry, with an at date time format annotation, there's some magic when, when you print that out. It automatically formats using your preferred date format. And it's some sort of proxying magic that happens. Yes. Yeah. So you can use toString instead of creating an explicit date format everywhere. Mm -hmm. My note on that was need to try it, because I didn't 100% understand what he was talking about. But he seems to think it was a good feature. Um, and then again, just from the, uh, from the DevOx photos that they posted on Flickr, they had just sort of bursts of, of pictures of everybody. And I tried to pick the most flattering one from each presenter. But I thought this one was really good. I'm, I'm getting like Emperor Palpatine electrocuting <laughs> Luke Skywalker here. <laughs> Could be a piano. I think it's more like electrocution by the dark side. Yeah, it needs purple lightning and, and like a hood. He does have the right expression. He does, and the right, the right hand gesture. OK, so the next talk I, I went to was called Young Pups, New Collection APIs for Java 9. And this was the talk where Stuart Marks told us that we can't have map literals. We can't have map literals in Java. So you know how all the other programming languages, if you, want, if you want some map that you know what it is at compile time, you can put some notation with keys and values where the keys and values don't get sort of mixed up with each other. You just swear back to the string in it? Yeah, you don't want that. Ow. No, you don't. They checked, they checked, and, and the answer that they came up with was that you don't want that. So. It's going to be more work for them to implement it than the joy that you would get out of having it. So what you get instead is APIs that are perfectly OK for like set and list. You have set.of and list.of. They're using default static methods on the interfaces. And those are, you know, those are fine. That, that's readable. It's not that much to type. And, Probably IntelliJ would convert a bunch of values in square brackets into set.of anyway, so you're, you're probably good there. But maps are still a, a real sticking point because wh what they've settled on is that if you want to map with up to five key value pairs, you can use map.of key, comma value, comma key, comma value, comma key, comma value. And they've got all the overloads up to five pairs. If you want more than five pairs, this is where they draw the line. And they're like, no, guys, we're not typing this out six times. <laughs> so what you get is a var args invocation, uh, again, on the map interface. It's map.of, and it takes a variable number of map.entry objects. Uh, <laughs> 
and did he get booed off the stage? Because if not, he I'm should have. Kind of disappointed. That's because we're right there. Yeah. <laughs> After five did booze. Just like, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so what they what he did for us there, in his infinite generosity, is. Uh, what we get is a, on the map.entry interface, which is a sub-interface of map, we have now a static default method called entry. So it's map.entry.little e entry, which you can static import if you want. And then so you're going to have map.of entry brackets key comma value unbracket comma entry bracket key comma value unbracket comma and so on. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we wanted. Um, <laughs> didn't, didn't want to just you know, have ellipses and then throw an error if you didn't have a new number? So. No. Uh, the the map.of that gets you up to five key value pairs is using generics, of course. And it has a k and a v generic variable. So as long as your keys and values are of different types, the compiler should catch it if you get them out of line with each other. But it's still just not good. Yeah, it was a it was a change to the language, and they don't want to change it. My personal hope is that one day we'll get named parameters at method call sites, and that when they do that, the syntax for map literals will fall out of it. One day, perhaps. Um, yeah. Or you know, just built-in syntax for the language for tuples. Yeah, no, they could do tuples. They would. <laughs> Map literals would fall out of tuples. Be Might be Scala, except with like a type <laughs> system that doesn't understand a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be like readable Scala. So <laughs> Fair point, well made. <laughs> um, so the good news of all of this is that they are, th with all of the effort they saved on not giving us the map literals we needed, <laughs> they put a lot of work into optimizing the implementations of what these dot of methods will actually return. So if you get list dot of one thing or set dot of one thing, um, that's a special type that implements lists in a really obvious way or set in a really obvious way. And it's going to have order one performance for everything and, and very small amount of storage. So according to their research, they, they love to mine Maven Central for use cases and stuff like that. According to their research, this is going to have significant performance impact on a lot of open source software. I can see that, actually. will reduce memory consumption significantly, speed everything up, uh, having these tailored implementations for very small collections. I know I end up with a lot of like, one and two item maps. And it's not yeah, you do. You get a lot of one and two item maps, and those will perform extremely well. They're not, they're not like hash buckets with separate chaining. They're, a lot of them are based more on the key forwarding concept. Um, so I, I think all in all, it's, it's going to be a, a performance win, but not not as big of a source code win as we were hoping for, I think. Uh, there was something else? No, that was it. Um, next talk I went to was presented by a Google developer evangelist. It was called Distributed Loads Testing with Kubernetes, which if I learned one thing, it was how to pronounce that word. Um, I was hoping to learn a lot about distributed load testing because I need to do that in the project that I'm working on. Instead, I learned how to deploy generic applications on Google's cloud platform. So <laughs> the distributed load testing, not so much. It was mentioned, but it wasn't discussed. Uh, the, the whole cloud deployment orchestration stuff was discussed at great length. Uh, and it turns out it's fine. It's not like wrong for distributed load testing, but there's nothing about it that makes it especially well suited to distributed load testing. So if it's your cloud platform, totally do that. But if it's not, you wouldn't want to like use it for load testing your other cloud because it's, it's not 
There's no, nothing special about it that makes it good for load testing, as far as I learned. Uh, next talk after that was called Shooting the Rapids, Maximizing the Performance of Java 8 Streams. And this talk was basically a one hour talk about probably don't put dot parallel in your Java 8 stream processing <laughs> code. Even if it runs faster on your machine, it might actually run slower in production because um, there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, reasons. reasons, yeah. Uh, one big one is that garbage collection gets slower when you have a lot of active threads. And when you're on some sort of shared infrastructure, you're in a container, there's already thousands of other threads doing stuff in other containers that you don't even know about. Um, you get stragglers, threads that take a longer time to reach the VM's safe point, which is where all the threads have to come to a safe point before a garbage collection operation can happen. Even if it's happening in parallel, all the threads have to reach a safe point before the parallel garbage collection operation can start. And when you've got tons of busy threads doing all sorts of stuff, these safe points take longer to reach. And all the threads that have reached the safe point have to wait for all the stragglers to get there too before they can continue. And so your amazingly 30% faster dot parallel operation on your laptop that wasn't doing anything might turn into a 20% slower operation on the server that's doing a lot of other stuff as well. So that was the main lesson of this talk. So. Maybe. It, it might be, but they didn't say it's never better. They said they've been surprised by when it's better. So I think the bottom line is if you don't test often, test in production. Because that's. <laughs> is it, isn't it a fixed thread pool for parallel that you're sharing amongst everything else in your process, though? Yes, the, the default thread pool for dot parallel is the number of cores on the machine minus one. And it counts, if you're on hyper-threading, it counts the hyper-threads as separate cores. So if you're on an eight-core hyper-threaded machine, you'll have 15 workers in the dot parallel thread pool. But the, their point was that, sure, you're on an eight-core hyper-threaded machine, but it's a container with uh, 17 other workloads also running. And the JVM has no idea what's going on outside of its container. So that brought us to the end of the day, and then it was like 5 a.m. Toronto time or something, and so I went to the spring buff. Um, and this was in a very small room with no ventilation. <laughs> and all the seats were taken, so I was standing up a little bit higher than everyone else, and, and heat rises, and I don't actually know what happened there. I just remember that it was really hot. <laughs> <laughs> and humid, really humid as well. Yes. Yes. Um, so I have no notes for that session. I was just trying to, <laughs> I was just trying to, to survive. Uh, after that, I went into the, against it, perhaps my better judgment, into the other buff room, which had, a, had been equally full with a different buff. Um, and they had the Java pub quiz, which was actually a whole lot of fun. It was 20 multiple choice questions. Everybody got a form to fill out, and they asked questions. We were in teams of four. They supplied beer and, and pub grub. And uh, our team came in second. We got 15 out of 20. The winning team got 16, so we were close. I thought this might be a fun thing to do at a, at a future jug meeting, we'll get prizes and stuff. But uh, we'll get Donnie to make the questions. Yes. Yeah, we'll get Donnie yeah, to make the questions. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. All get zero. <laughs> yeah, there were some what would this print. There was that question, uh, the, the trivia question Dan asked earlier. It's that DevOps wasn't the original name of this conference. What was it called before? Um, and uh, we were the only team who got that right, actually. That was good. Um, it was good. A and it was done in the, the slides all ran, uh, they were all timed. So they were auto advancing, and the quiz took exactly 10 minutes or something to sort of 30 <coughs> seconds per question. And uh, then we had five minutes to swap score sheets and, and mark each other's pages, and somebody won. 
So that was a, a fun thing. First time I've ever seen a buff like that at a conference, but it was good. So before we move on to the next conference day, talk about the exhibition hall, which is part of every conference. It's where the sponsors set up shop and give you free stuff. Um, that's what it looked like. It was usually a little more crowded than that because in between sessions, everybody left all those eight giant theaters and crowded into this small space. Um, so that was, that was like a comfortable amount of crowd there in that picture. So like, I don't know, JFrog was there, they had frogs. Some other company was there, they had little like dribble things. Uh, when I saw this, the only thought I had was, <laughs> was that the cake is a lie. <laughs> This is at the Microsoft booth. They claim it was for real. I, I don't know. Yeah, Microsoft had a booth there. They've had a booth there for a while because they want you to use Azure. Uh, okay. The year we went, they were very, very happy to talk to us forever at Microsoft. Yes, they didn't have cake. We were like the only people who talked to them. <laughs> what was the cake? The cake was good, actually. The cake was good. Tasty, tasty lies. <laughs> yes. Heroku was there. They had patches. Um, I don't know if those were software patches or not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Pyara was there. Red Hat was there with, with draft beer. That was good. Uh, Pivotal was there as well. They had some bottled beer, not shown in this picture. Um, okay, day four. I went to this talk first because I actually needed to make a couple of Gradle plugins for the project I'm working on. And I learned some valuable things that weren't in the documentation but should have been. So it was a good talk. It's on YouTube now, so if you ever need to make a Gradle plugin, search for this talk on YouTube and you'll learn things that weren't in the docs. Uh, one of them was a bug that's been open for like six years or something um, that when you're testing your plugins, some stuff doesn't work unless you know the secret. And <laughs> I wish I could remember what the secret was, but if you watch this talk, you'll know. Actually, it's, it's in my notes. You have to call project.evaluate during the test in order for the after evaluate hook in the plugin to run. And after evaluate is where you put a lot of your Gradle plugin logic. So the Gradle provides a, a little bit of a test project builder. Project is the sort of like the root object in the whole hierarchy of your Gradle. And you can build a testing project object using the project builder from in your test, like say in the before of your test. Uh, but then when you call stuff on your project, like run your tasks, the after evaluating the task doesn't run. So that makes it very difficult to test it. So you have to call project.evaluate in before as well. And they don't mention that anywhere except this talk, which just happened a few weeks ago. Next, I went to a talk called Back to Basics, Back Pressured Asynchronous Scalable Immutable Composable Streams. Yikes. Yes. <laughs> it was almost the longest title of any talk I attended. Uh, Essentially, it's like a reactive publish subscribe type API that, that um, I think TypeSafe has been working on. This guy's Victor Klang. He's from TypeSafe, right? Yeah. Um, and it has Scala and Java APIs. And they think that they're on track for the Java side of the API to be in JDK 9 as a standard library. Um, and the main thrust of this talk was that when you have streams that you're distributing across network services, when the publisher is slower than the subscriber, a push model is most optimal. The publisher just sends new events to the subscriber as quickly as they become available and the subscriber can deal with them right away. Whereas when the subscriber is slower than the publisher, a push model is terrible because everything backs up into the publisher and the publisher gets stuck. Or the subscriber needs this huge unbounded queue to keep all of the messages in. 
or it has to drop messages and there's no policy around how to drop them. So what you want there is a, some sort of pull <coughs> model where the subscriber can pull new events when it's ready. Um, and this sort of reactive streams with back pressure thing has the property that when the publisher is faster, you get a kind of like a pull model that emerges out of the behavior of it. And when the publisher is slower, you get a push model just magically. It, it, its, behavior, its behavior is in line with what you sh would have been doing if you knew ahead of time which one was faster. So that's a neat thing. And, and we might see it in JDK 9 as a standard library. It'll have lambdas and stuff. The next talk was by another TypeSafe guy. And this one was called Without Resilience, Nothing Else Matters. And this was a really neat talk. It was much higher level than most of the other talks. He didn't really go into code at all. He talked more about people and processes. And um, it was actually a really good talk. I would recommend watching it because it's widely applicable to whatever you're doing. Resilience and fault tolerance are important to everything that we build. And this was a good talk just about the, the underpinnings of, of those concepts and why they're important and how you can achieve them and why we as, as software developers are often pushing the boundaries of, of safety. Um, th that's that picture in the background there is actually the, the shape on the, on the left is this sort of he was talking about where, where our system is in, in terms of, of the axes of safety and performance. And we don't know that we've gone over the line, the safety line, until there's a failure. And then when that happens, we kind of pull back. But we keep pushing forward because there's lots of other organizational reasons that we want to save money on hardware, have responses be faster, have upgrades be easier, and so on. And, and we keep stepping over that line and only taking a step back when there's a failure. And uh, he had some ideas around how to be smarter about being close to that line without stepping over it. So good talk. I can't summarize it very eloquently, but it's worth an hour of your life. Uh, then there was this talk, which I went to because the talk I wanted to go to, which was Chaos Engineering from Netflix, was extremely full, and I couldn't get in. Um, but it turned out to be fun, a little bit informative, mostly just fun. Uh, this guy is a developer advocate for JetBrains, and he was talking about the silver bullet syndrome, and it was just sort of an hour of pure entertainment. Basically looking back at, at the past, all the things that we thought were going to be amazing and solve all of our problems and reduce all of the pain in programming to nothing, turning out to be all just a big load of bullshit. And then he turned his attention to the current hyped things and gave them the same treatment. So that was a good sort of uh, counterpoint to Lawrence Krauss's keynote, which is that no matter what we do, even if, even if it's awesome, it's all just going to vaporize in the end. Uh, yeah, uh, my favorite one was uh, he was talking about JavaScript and, and Node.js. And apparently, he presented this talk at a JavaScript developer conference. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not well received. <laughs> and the message they took from it was that he was shitting all over JavaScript. And uh, he wanted to point out, no, I'm shitting all over everything. It's, uh, JavaScript did not receive special treatment in this talk. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, took, they took that part more seriously at the JavaScript he, conference. He sure did. Yeah, microservices were, were like the last 10 minutes of this presentation. Um, this one is on YouTube. If, if you want an hour of laughing at yourself and, and feeling like it's all futile, this, this uh, <laughs> probably like neck and neck with Lawrence Krauss's <laughs> talk about how the whole universe is doomed anyway. Um, <laughs> so next was a talk. This is a format that's always fun. It was Ask the JDK Architects. Just a bunch of people who don't normally respond to your emails are <laughs> <laughs> standing up in the front of the room, taking questions from the crowd. And uh, yeah, it's, it's fun because you can see their body language when people ask questions they don't want to answer. <laughs> and you don't get that on, on like mailing lists. Yeah, they haven't asked about the maps. Is that the collections guy? Yeah. 
He's, uh, he's wearing a, a doctor's, uh, what do you call that, a coat? Um, a stethoscope and a, a, a coat. Um, he is also, uh, other responsibility of his for JDK9 is to deprecate more stuff and add some new deprecation annotations to the platform. So the idea is we, we only have at deprecated right now. And as we all know, there are some things in the JDK that have been deprecated since 1.0 that are still there and still work exactly the same as they did in Java 1.0 and that they will never remove. Because they're deprecated because they're not the best way of doing a thing, not because you can't. And they want to be able to apply some deprecation to like Java util calendar and Java util date and some other types that you shouldn't be using now that there's Java 8. And the problem is at deprecated is too blunt of an instrument. So what they want is sort of a family of maybe two or three deprecated annotations. Guilt? Yeah, well, one of them is, is just like, do, you shouldn't use this anymore because there's a much better thing and you should use that instead. If, this, if you use this, you're bad and you should feel bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, I thought I add, add WTF. Yeah. Can we use mm -hmm. for code review automation? Mm -hmm. And if you've got a code base that you don't really intend to maintain, you just need to fix bugs occasionally, you could ignore those particular annotations because you're not doing active development in that code base anymore and there's really no benefit to upgrading away from an API that's going to be there forever that you just shouldn't be using in new code. So they want to be a little bit more explicit about what, what they mean by deprecated in those public APIs. Then, of course, there's going to be the more severe one, like this is actually going away in the next release and things like that. Those, those you would even care about for maintenance mode projects. So, so are they going to deprecate deprecated? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> see? You should have been a DevOps because that would have been an excellent question. <laughs> I don't know if deprecated can target annotations. It probably should be able to. Because you need to be able to deprecate annotations, right? That's true. This is a good question. <laughs> Mark Reinhold keeps saying he wants to call the new annotation denigrated, but every, everybody else on the stage frowns every time he says that, so I don't think it's going to be that. Um, the guy in the red shirt is Robert Field. He is writing the Java um, the redevelop print loop for Java, JShell, which is going to be a standard part of Java 9. Cool. So it's kind of like Bean Shell, but probably works a little bit better, and uh, it will be... The Ruby REPL, REPL is um, Ruby IRB, IRB yeah. Interactive Ruby. The, um, and then also not pictured here because he ended up carrying the microphone around to everybody was Alan Bateman, who is also involved in JDK architecture type stuff. Then I went to a talk called Java Generics, Past, Present, and Future. Sounded like it would be fun and informative, and it was, but it wasn't that informative, I guess, because I didn't take any notes during it. I mean, they, they talked about all the things you would expect about generics. They showed us how wild cards happen, while, where you'd use lower bounded and upper bounded wild cards, um, the fact that there are union types and that there are a few kind of like edge cases where they're useful in Java. Um, and that was, it was interesting. They said the future may or may not include reified generics. It's not a surprise. I put that slide in by accident. I didn't go to that talk, so I can't tell you what happened. Um, and then, so whiteboards. DevOps always has whiteboards in the hall in between all the theaters. So I thought these might be fun for us to absorb and discuss. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Whoops. <laughs> Who remembers using Enlightenment? I remember Enlightenment. Yeah. Like 1997 or something. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, no, no, the Vadim team was there, so. They were really nice and they were giving out like nice handbars. I'm guessing the last seven votes in the first row were by the same person, just based on the stroke consistency. There's an infinite number of people using Grails. Mm. I guess one person knows that. It's just a whiteboard. Anybody could write anything they wanted on it. This one turned into people asking questions about frameworks, I think. Fly Frey, yeah. More people like Angular than not. <laughs> Maven is winning the build tool popularity contest. Basil and Miscellaneous <coughs> made the chart, but didn't get any votes. <laughs> SBT didn't make the chart, but got seven votes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised by that. Maven's older. I just started for the first time. It's good. Just remember to turn on the Gradle daemon because it's off by default. That's important. Uh, what else? Is Java EE still relevant? It's <laughs> <laughs> like a little bit of the CDI back and forth there. <laughs> Top desk in the house got nine votes. Five people use ERA and one person didn't know what that was. <coughs> Somebody wrote a heart emoticon by hand. Should there be Java 10 and 11? Mostly yes. What is Raml? Has anyone used Raml? No. Is it like Swagger? <coughs> I know, but the fact that it's only three versus two is just kind of sad for everyone. Well, this confirms what we already knew about our industry, which is that nobody documents anything. <laughs> <laughs> Was Oracle right to fire the evangelists? Four people said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so were any of the evangelists supposed to talk at Java 1, or like how did they get around that? A few of them spoke at Java 1 because they've been hired by other companies, but they weren't talking about things that Oracle cares about. Yeah, that was actually a, a meme throughout the conference is, is MongoDB being good at deleting your data for you. <laughs> 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 
being good at what? Deleting your data for you. Yeah, you could put stuff in there. Yeah. You can delete your data quickly and efficiently. <coughs> Favorite IDEs. Paint. There's a whole Paint. Java. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's so good. There, there were like a hundred, a hundred comments on Reddit about using Paint as an IDE. <laughs> JDev, there's a, a note that says, is this a joke, basically. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. hey, no, you I, can I take seriously, JDev, forget it. <laughs> no, I want to meet the three people who developed Java and Nano. Good God, why? It's a bad idea. <laughs> it's like the other Word? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. These are the drunks. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Visual stupid stuff. Visual stupid stuff. Just jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Xamarin is for people who hate Java. Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's barely one person. Adam. No, I wanted more of those. <laughs> those all the boards. I put every single one on there. So people using Adam, that's nice. Yeah. The GitHub editor. It's the GitHub web view text editor. Let's do it here. Let's do it's it. Not it's not bad. Bad. Eclipse. Who's using Eclipse? About the same. <laughs> Two? It's good. <laughs> Do we have other? <laughs> Haven't voted yet? I used Vim back when I had to, or it was VI really. <laughs> Make it but sound like someone had a your head <laughs> when I had to. No, it was just the only choice, because Emacs wasn't on the machine. <laughs> well, when you're doing but incremental recovery, you probably want to remember those things. Yeah. Uh, I've had to do bare metal recovery where we couldn't start up bin that because the user would come out, <laughs> so I had to remember all the end commands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm proficient yeah. in Vim, but I wouldn't choose to use it when there's something else that's a modeless editor available. Yeah. I don't. I don't think I've. I was an guy in university, and I just realized that I wasted my time with Emacs. To me, Emacs is. I don't think I've ever used Nano in preference to Vim, but I've used Cat. Ubuntu, the default editor, system editor is Nano. Oh, weird. I've used cat in preference to Vim before. It's because they don't like <laughs> Ubuntu forums full of people asking how to close their Vim. <laughs> <laughs> cat only has one mode. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally, I'm totally cool with the modeless stuff. UX people figured that out in like the 70s. Modeless UIs are superior. Yes. Well, I use I use um, Emacs keyboard macros for that. They're good for that too. I don't want to get into that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's using a different operating system. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, an OS. So the last day of the conference was a half day. Everything shuts down at lunchtime on day five. So this was a cool talk. This is probably my favorite talk of the whole conference. Software architecture as code. Um, let me try to summarize it as best I can. But I recommend that you all go and watch it, because it's great. Um, one idea that, that he opened up with is that the language that we use to describe software architecture, including the word architecture itself, is far from universal. He said that he, he cited a study where a bunch of software developers from various places were sat down and asked to write in 100 words what software architecture is. And every respondent had a wildly different answer from every other respondent. So it doesn't actually really mean anything to start with. Um, distinctions such as logical models, conceptual models, physical models also are not universal. 
We all know exactly what that means, but our understanding of it isn't shared with anybody else in this room. Um, he also pointed out something that we all know, which is that stacked up block diagrams of architectures are useless. Those are those marketing diagrams where you have like the big thing underneath and then a bunch of vertical slices that are all subtly different in size and we're not sure if the size differences mean anything and then there's like a bunch of stuff they couldn't fit in up like the right hand side and, and then some layers on top that span some but not all of the parts and that seems perhaps significant. Uh, those, <laughs> those are about as useful as, as your understanding of them. Architecture, exactly. Architecture is pointless. Um, so the corollary to all of this is that what we lack is a common vocabulary for talking about software architecture, whatever that is. Uh, and his insight was that standard abstractions are more important than standard notation. So UML being a standard notation for software architecture and data flow and a lot of other things, UML covers a wide variety of topics. Um, is not really that important compared to having a common idea of what are the things we're representing. And the analogy he used to illustrate this was the idea of a map. You can look at maps on, actually, strangely enough, I was looking at maps earlier. You can look at maps on, on Google Maps and Bing and OpenStreetMap and paper maps that were produced 100 years ago. And they all use completely different notations from each other. Roads and geographical features and political boundaries and coastlines and railroads, everything is, is different in the visual design notation. But we can look at any of those maps and understand what all the symbols mean. And that was, that was the big insight at the beginning of this talk that he started with, is that we don't have any trouble reading an arbitrary map that somebody hands to us and understanding what the features are because we have a common vocabulary for what those features are. We know about roads and railroads and cities and industrial areas and swamps and rivers and so on. So what he was recommending in this talk was that we agree on four common concepts. Uh, from the top being software systems. Underneath software systems, you have them composed of containers. Containers are composed of components, and components are composed of classes. And with those classes, yeah. So with those four concepts, you can draw diagrams using whatever notation you feel like, as long as it's self-consistent, of the whole software system diagram. Here's my system. It's a box. Here are all the things that interact with it. You can use boxes and arrows and lines and dotted lines and whatever you want. You just stick a legend there, just like as if it was a map. And then everybody can understand what that means. And then your next level of abstraction is containers. And here are all the containers my software system is made up of. And these might be individual processes that run. And you can show boxes and arrows to show how they connect with and communicate with each other. And then there's the component level, where inside of each box, there's some set of modules that communicate with each other in some way. And you can draw that and provide a legend. And it's understandable. And uh, he said he often doesn't go down to the class level, because it's not usually necessary. And those things at that level of detail change frequently and don't particularly need diagrams. Um, so then he said, at, at the component level, which is kind of the lowest level of abstraction that he recommends everybody should produce diagrams for their system. Sorry to jump yeah. in. Uh, we will need the room in about 10 minutes. OK. Um, but yeah, you're welcome to go to the, uh, the store after that. Great. Yeah. Thanks. I'll wrap up quickly. Um, uh, what he recommends is that if you use an architecturally evident style of coding, which might be something like Java EE or Spring, where modules kind of fall out of static analysis of the code, you could actually automatically produce the component level diagrams. And he had an open source project that does that. Um, and then he recommends basically at the system and container level, you produce those things by hand because they change very infrequently and they 
benefit from human attention. Um, so his project is called Structurizer with the final E missing from the name and it's on GitHub. <laughs> and then he has a thing that's not open source that you can use over the web as a service or you can pay for um, that turns the Structurizer graphs into nice looking diagrams. Um, and that was also a really good talk, if for nothing else, than the first half of it where he talks about why we're at odds with each other over notation. So a structurizer give you software architecture after you've written the code? <laughs> it's, uh, he recommends you make it part of your continuous integration pipeline and that with each build you produce a new structure diagram of, of the module level. Um, there's a Java, sort of like a fluent Java API for declaring what the diagrams should contain. Uh, but it can discover most of it from annotated classes. Uh, next talk, unrestful web services with HTTP2. Basically talks about how HTTP2 with its ability to push content to clients that clients didn't ask for, so that REST is perhaps turned a little bit on its head and, and what are the implications of that. Final talk, this guy uh, is not a Java developer, but he had a very popular talk because it had a great title. I used his capitalization and punctuation. 115 batshit stupid things you can put on the internet as fast as I can go, somebody get me a drink. And he basically just ranted and raved for an hour about a thing he did once, which was scan all of the IPv4 addresses for open, unpassword protected VNC servers and then take a screenshot of whatever they presented when he connected. <laughs> <laughs> and on the whole internet, at the time that he ran the scan, there were 115 such things. Uh, some of them controlled things like municipal flood control dams in France. Um, there were quite, quite a few hotel lobby information displays. Um, all sorts of different stuff. Uh, some industrial process type stuff. He, he was especially fond of pointing out things that dealt with um, kilovolts and megawatts. Um, so that was eye-opening. With, with modern internet connections, it doesn't take that long to port scan 4 billion IPs. Yeah. Uh, and finally, big thanks to the DevOx team. This is them. And they put on a great conference every year, and I will definitely go back again in the future. So thanks, everyone.